How do you help a brand be true to a character or a spirit that they themselves have yet to be able to articulate to you? And you're an outsider here, presumably. You know, it's not that often that I get an opportunity to speak to people who are actively still working in this space that we left behind a few years back. So it's always kind of nice. It's like a trip down memory lane. So Mika, you're one of those people. So you're working over at Trollback and you have a really interesting title. You're the Director of Creative Strategy. That's a big lofty kind of title, Director of Creative Strategy. It sounds wonderful. I think I know what it is, but for people who don't know who you are, can you introduce yourself and tell us what it is that you do and a little bit of your story, please? Definitely. My name is Mika Salidas. As you said, I'm the Director of Creative Strategy at a branding and design studio, Trowback and Company. Um, it's a, I'd say it's a fairly new title within the industry. Um, Trollback started in the motion graphics world back in the late 90s, I think in 99. Um, but recently, you know, we've grown into a studio that handles, we still do design and animation and motion graphics, but we're doing a lot more brand strategy, content strategy, those kinds of things. So for me specifically, a lot of my work is kind of what consumers and audiences don't see. It's a lot of brand strategy work, positioning, building brand voice guides, conducting workshops, kind of the foundations that designers or writers can kind of consistently and cohesively bring to life. So that's kind of half of the job. That's the, I'd say the strategy part of creative strategy. And then the creative side is uh, the more consumer facing manifestation of that strategic element. So that's campaigns, spots, advertising, marketing, um, partly leading teams of writers, and then I'm partly on the box or, or whatever the writing uh, version of being on the box is, um, but coming up with concepts, taglines, script writing, that sort of thing. So there's kind of two sides of house. Wonderful. Okay, a lot of things for me to unpack there. And what makes it really interesting for me is also looking into your background. Uh, you graduated from USC as a communications major. Okay, these these are like lofty, <laughs> like what? A communications major, what is a communication communications major prepared to do once you're done with school? Yeah, I was prepared to do pretty much anything. I, I chose, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I didn't uh -huh. know what I wanted to do out of school. So I chose the major that seemed like it had the most possible pathways. So I actually started at Ithaca College in upstate New York for a year. Um, I was in the film program there. And then I transferred to USC for the film program. And I spent about a semester in the film program and saw how crazy passionate the students were there, staying up till four or five in the morning, making these student films. And, and I realized pretty quickly that wasn't me. I didn't really have that passion for the film industry. So I was kind of back to ground zero. So I, I ended up choosing communication um, just to get a good solid foundation. I knew I was interested in, in writing and, and maybe marketing, but not really sure how or how that might come to life. So communication felt like it would give me a foundation to do a lot of different things with. How old were you when you realized that maybe film isn't your thing relative to who is doing it? I was, I was probably about two months into my sophomore year of college or two months into uh, my first year at USC. I, I just saw this passion that people had mm -hmm. and I thought I had that and, and I just, I didn't. And I, I also think I realized I'm much better at when it comes to creative writing, doing that in the short form. So I, I think my, my talents lie more in, in tagline writing or 30 second promo writing. But whenever I see someone writing a feature length film and the complexities and the story arcs and these sub arcs within them, I, my mind just doesn't work like that. And I, luckily by being thrown into the fire in that film school, you kind of realize that. So that's kind of, how that came to be. I see. So you're either in your late teens or early twenties when you realize, Hey, this is not the right thing for me. Is that about right? Yep. Okay. The reason why I asked you this is, you know, I don't want to presume somebody's like going uh, from high school to college. Cause sometimes people take a little detour. That's high level self-awareness for someone. I, mean, I just want to point that out. Like you're like, wait, I thought I loved this. This is what I thought I was going to do. And you look around like, oh, these are animals next to me. And if I'm going to go somewhere in life, I'm like, this is not my jam. Uh, so what is it about you that you're, you're 
you you have that sense of self and that you have the confidence to say, you know what, it was a good plan going in. I got to change the plan. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I've never really been afraid to, to take a leap because in, in that case, it's not like I found a different passion and I just started pursuing something else and jumping right into it. I just knew this is what I didn't want to do, but I didn't have an answer for what I did want to do. So something in me, there's this intuition knowing this probably isn't the path. And I, I kind of tried to follow that intuition, even though I'm not sure where that's going to eventually lead me. Um, it led me to a place I'm, I'm very happy with now. So I, I'm glad I did it. But but I guess it's, you know, being okay with taking a chance, even though I'm not sure where, where I'm going to land. Mm. Is there anything that happened in your childhood that started to build confidence in that ability to, to, to go somewhere where you're not quite sure? It's a great question. You know, I, I think it probably started when I went to college. Um, there wasn't really any, you know, I was, I had a dream always of, of going to USC and, uh, I wanted, I wanted a school that was, in a big city with palm trees. And my first semester I ended up at Ithaca College because I ended up getting a scholarship there. Um, so it kind of seemed like, well, there's a scholarship, this is a safe thing to do. And I realized that it just, it wasn't the school for me, I didn't really like it. And that was probably the first big leap I took where I realized, you know, this doesn't feel right to me, this doesn't feel like a fit. I've always had this dream of being in LA and USC was my dream school, mostly because of the film school. Um, so I, I reapplied, I, I got in again, and it would have been a lot easier to just go back to the college I was at the next year, but I decided to, to pack everything up about three or four weeks before the semester started and move out to LA and, and try something new. Can you tell me a little bit about what the inner voice sounded like? Because I think a lot of people feel what you feel, but they never act on it because they don't recognize the voice or they talk themselves out of it. So in your mind, like when you're going to Ithaca, like what are you thinking about and what is it that you're saying to yourself and how do you find it that you can say, okay, you know what, I'm going to move from one side of the country to the other in a place where I don't know much about and I'm just going to go for it. Like what, what does that voice sound like? I think uh, I always try to think of how I'm going to feel at the end and I still have that voice if there's, you know, this big presentation that I'm just getting really nervous about and I'm dr not dreading, but you know, there's, there's a lot going into it. And I'm thinking, you know, I, this is a big hill that I have to climb. But I, I think of what that feeling is, once it's done, and how happy I was that that I went through that, and I did it. I think that's kind of what happened when I was transferring to it, it would have been a lot more comfortable, like I said, just to stay where I was and ride it out for a few years and then figure it out. But in my head, I was thinking, you know, imagine where you could be if you just took this one step. It's, you know, one step that could impact years. And it did. It, I lived in LA for 17 or 18 years. So it was a big, scary step, but it was just one step that impacted so much more in my life. I just want to clarify one thing. If I remember correctly, you were born and raised in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, right? Yep. And then you said 17, 18 years after you made this decision to, you know what, I'm going to pack my bags. I'm going to go to USC and see what happens. And that one decision lasted 17 or 18 years, right? Yeah. I moved out to LA in 2004 and I made the move back to Minneapolis uh, in 2020. So yeah, 16 years I ended up out there. Wow. Okay. So I, I want to clarify something here. And, and I do this as well, so it's kind of interesting for me just to hear someone else say it, is that you looked forward into the future about where this could lead. And instead of going to a dark place, you focus your energy on the positive outcome, and that excited you a lot. And sometimes that's enough for you to make that big, bold, and courageous decision. Did I hear that right? Absolutely, yeah. And I, I still do that today. You know, last week there was a, a big presentation to a few different presidents at a, a company and you know, I, I've been doing this for over a decade now, but it's still, um, you know, still nerve wracking and still get anxiety when there's a crowd like that, that you're presenting to. But again, you know, I just think, okay, I know how good this feels once I'm done with something like that. And I just try to put myself in that mindset that, 
you're going to get to this place once you once you just go ahead and make this leap. Mm. So uh, I just want to relate an experience and a realization I had recently in that uh, I often am asked to speak and my schedule is such that I don't have a lot of time to prepare. And oftentimes I'm writing a new talk. And so I go through that stage, which I think a lot of creative people can relate to the dreading part, the getting started, getting all your ducks in a row, the procrastination, like I'm going to read a couple more books. I'm going to watch a few more videos instead of just doing the work. And I started to feel that weight. But then I thought about something, something that I heard um, Eric Edmeads talk about. He, he does a talk for Mind Valley on public speaking. He says, you have your primary strategic uh, objective, and then you have your secondary strategic objective. And the second, secondary strategic objective is where you envision, like, if this goes really well, what might happen? In the world of possibilities, what else might happen? And so I thought, wow, okay, on the one hand, it's a lot of work, and I want to make the producer book me really happy. That's my primary objective. But the secondary objective is if I do really, really well, the people who attend will invite me to speak in their country. And when I started to think about that, it got me really excited. And all of a sudden, I can feel the pressure lift off me slowly until I was just so amped. Even though physically I was tired, I was up to two, three, four in the morning, and then I would go to sleep and go right back at it. And I was super pumped up. And I want to capture that feeling I'm trying to share, not just with you, but with our audience. It sounds to me like you went through a very similar thing, leaving one university for another and just thinking, wow, I want to be in those next to those palm trees and be outside in shorts and a t-shirt during winter. And you started looking forward and things sounded really good. So it got you excited for that future for yourself. Yeah, I think thinking like that kind of turns that anxiety into excitement. And I should say, I also totally get that, that dreading feeling. Um, I think when I'm in that place, I always equate it to cleaning your room or cleaning a house where everything gets way messier earlier, early in the process for me before it finally gets cleaner and you can make sense of what it is you're presenting or, or what this, how this manifests. So yeah, I, I can totally relate on that level too, because I see the mess that's going to happen, but then eventually it, uh, it clears up for me. Mm. Okay. So let's jump forward in time a little bit. You go to USC, you graduate with, as a communications major and you wind up at a couple of different places and I kind of see this movement uh, where did you land? What did you do? And how, tell me about the experience of getting your first uh, professional work opportunity. Yeah. So right after I graduated, I decided to sign a lease without a job because I knew I wanted to be in LA. And then I was scrambling for a job. So I honestly would have taken the first job I was offered. And I did take the first job I was offered, which happened to be uh, a receptionist role at a um, branding, I think a brand consultancy, they call themselves called Troika. Um, which was based in Hollywood. And so I was a receptionist for a year. I was, I knew nothing about the industry. Um, they also did uh, at the time, a lot of motion graphics and branding, mostly for entertainment clients. Um, I didn't know that industry even existed. So for a year I was taking lunch orders, answering phones, taking out the trash, just kind of getting my hands dirty and, and learning what this industry was. Um, and I was lucky enough to land at an agency like that where they had a pipeline where each receptionist had moved up through the company. And now there's five or six of us who, um, one was an executive producer at Jeopardy. One's a creative director at another agency called We Are Royale. Um, one was a producer at a TV network. So we all kind of ended up working our way through the industry. Um, but the typical path was going from a receptionist to a producer. That was kind of the pathway for a receptionist at Troika. And I kind of realized that, again, that that didn't seem like something that was super interesting to me. I had this kind of creative itch inside of me and I, I didn't quite know how to scratch it yet. I didn't know what I was good at or <laughs> I knew I liked writing. I didn't know if I was good at writing. Um, so I ended up on this pathway that was more kind of an in-house PR person for Troika. Uh, so I worked on the business development side. I was writing press releases and, you know, trying to pick up some publications and some press for these projects that these creative directors were leading. And um, after a couple of years, I realized, you know, I think I can do this creative work. I, 
it's it's fine writing about this amazing work that's coming out of this agency, but I, I'd like to actually be a part of doing that. So I started um, I started moonlighting at nights. I was still doing my you know the PR job during the day, um, but a couple executive producers at the agency knew that I was interested in in more creative writing. So I, I'd throw my ideas into that hat when some pitches came in and uh, kind of got my feet wet that way. Okay, there's a couple of parts here I'm trying to figure out. So you go to USC, presumably a very expensive school to go to. Um, scholarships or anything, any grants aside, it's an expensive school to go to. You get a school, you're going to take any viable job. Of all the different jobs I can think of where you apply to, because you said you didn't know anything about the industry that you were going into, how did Troika even get on your radar as an opening? Did somebody tell you about it? Did you read about it? What happened there? If my memory serves me correctly, I think there was a website called entertainmentcareers.net or it was something like that. And I think I was scrolling through there, mostly just looking for if TV networks were going to hire because I, I interned at a TV network um, in college between my junior and senior year. And I was a PA on The Biggest Loser one summer. So I was kind of interested in that space. So I honestly didn't really know of any agencies other than the the Leo Burnett's and the Ogilvy's of the world. I didn't know there were like these brand consultancies um, until I saw that posting. So I honestly was, was looking more for, for TV network gigs and kind of stumbled upon that. Wow. It's quite interesting because like your decision to move to USC or to transfer to USC or, or get into USC, that your first job takes you on a whole nother adventure that, I mean, your life would be totally different now if it was like in like, like a, uh, software company like a startup or something you'd, you'd be doing something totally differently right yeah and i could have easily landed there like i said i needed to i needed to make rent so yeah they offered me the job it was the only job offer i had so i took it <laughs> well this is where i think your usc pedigree pays off because if it were me sorting through resumes i'm like here's a young person usc communications major great answer the phones right like use that that uh, education and, and use that uh, that pedigree to your advantage and there you are okay so you said you you stayed in that position as the receptionist for about a year and then you moved into doing pr uh, how did that happen uh because if you were listening like they could be four years into receptionist gig and like wait how come i wasn't offered that like what happened there how did you create that opportunity for yourself or how did it materialize yeah so typically uh the receptionists were in that role for about a year and then they'd move on to a, I think it was production coordinator was where they would go on the production side of the house. Um, but for me, this will date me. I think it must have been 2008. It was the holiday season and the agency really wanted to get a we for the studio and it was impossible to get. And I don't remember how I got my hands on one, but they tasked me with if would you be able to find a Wii for the studio? And I got one in there and the sales and marketing team decided that they thought I might be good on their team. Um, Cause I was, I guess, able to get things done and they liked that moxie. So um, again, I didn't know exactly that PR or business development was the path for me, but they saw something in me that they thought, you know, it could be a fit. So I ended up going in that direction. Um, rather than production, just because that side of the house kind of wanted to use my skill set. Mm. Okay, so it sounds to me like in 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 Troika, they seem to say you're going to make a one year commitment, and as positions open up, we move receptionists out into being a production coordinator, or junior producer, or something like that, right? Yep. And then your your ability to solve problems, your I'll figure it out at all costs kind of thing earned you the respect of a whole different team. And they're like, we'd like to draft you for our team. And so you're like, okay, that seems more interesting because I didn't want to become a producer. That's how that happened? Yep, that's that's exactly how it happened, yeah. That's so awesome. Okay, so some lessons to learn here. If you're going to be a receptionist at a company, make sure that they have a path forward and that you've spoken to people who were in that position, how long you're making that commitment for. Because look, I'm, I'm not trying to judge anybody. If you're the receptionist for the rest of your life and that's what makes you happy and that works for you, more power to you. But if that's not where you want to be, that's not your final station in life, you need to make sure you're smart and you're looking forward 
the company needs to be big enough. This is critical that there's room for you to grow into and departments and nooks and crannies that you can show your value to. So this is a critical skill. And obviously here, Mega, you found that and you're able to grow and you keep growing, you keep moving. Now, moving further along the timeline here, you spend seven years at Troika. What gets you to make the next move? The next move was um, I wanted to be on the creative side. So, you know, I was the communications manager at that point. I wanted to kind of start a totally different path. So the, um, the director of business development at Troika, he moved over to another agency who was similar in what they did called Loyal Casper and um, knew that I was trying to kind of make this career shift and said, you know, I'll take a flyer on you. Um, we'll bring you over here if you want to come. So um, it was thanks to, you know, someone knowing that I wanted to kind of shift career paths. They knew kind of the work I was capable of doing and, and took a chance on me and brought me over there. And was it hard for you to leave? How was, what was the departure like? Cause that's a thing that a lot of people struggle with. Like there's an opportunity, there's some security here and I go to work somewhere else, new, new job, new title, but if it doesn't work out, I'm just kind of screwed. How'd that go for you? There is nothing worse or scarier for me than quitting a job. I absolutely dread it. And I get that feeling again of, I really don't want to do this, but I'm picturing where I'm going to be. If I just have one difficult conversation, it could change my trajectory for years to come. And, and it did. Um, so yeah, you know, I was, I was definitely dreading it. I hate those conversations, but I'm glad I did because it gave me an opportunity to get more on the, the brand strategy and the creative marketing side of the industry. Now for people who are listening that feel that deep in their heart, like, Oh yeah. And some, some people can't make that decision. Can you tell us how you had that conversation and how it went to it? So see if we can learn something from it. I don't remember the intricacies of how it went down. I do remember that I was sweating and my heart was beating out of my chest. Um, and they were very, they were very nice about it, which, which I am very grateful for. Um, but I, I cannot remember the specifics of what I said other than, you know, I think I've carved a really clear path at this agency. I think I could kind of turn over a new leaf and try something else at this other agency. So I didn't feel pigeonholed necessarily, but I was really good at doing this certain thing, or I don't know if I was really good. I was, <laughs> I was doing this certain thing for one agency and they knew me for doing that thing. Um, and so I just said, you know, there's this other opportunity. They're going to try me out in a different capacity and I'm going to take that chance. Okay. So it's a little bit of a blur where you just remember elevated heart rate, maybe a little sweaty here and there and something happened, but then ultimately you, you did the hard thing and then you could move on to the next thing. Okay. So I'm going to just let everybody who's listening know that. So Mika graduates from, graduates from USC and then he goes to Troika and he works there for seven years. Then eventually he becomes a writer, senior creative strategist at another company called Loyal Casper. And he stays there for four years. Then he moves on to becoming the director of creative strategy. Now we're starting to see that title at a company called Compadre and he's there for, at, for three years. So you've moved around a little bit and now you're at Trollback and Company and with the same title, director of creative strategy. So now we get a sense of the evolution of who you are. And do you, do you, just out of curiosity, you keep in touch with people who graduated with you in, in, in communications to see what the heck they're doing today? Yeah, there's, there's a, a handful of people in the communications school that I still keep in touch with. A lot of my friends weren't in the communications department. They were business and engineering students. Um, but there's a handful of people. I, I studied abroad in, in London for a semester through the communications school. So there were about 28 of us who, who ended up really close. And I still keep in touch with a few of them. Is anybody working in the same industry? Not in the specific branding, creative marketing industry. Um, there are some people in the kind of social media marketing space. Um, one person's kind of doing crazy things with, uh, with Alexa and Amazon and kind of audio branding. 
um, but nobody specifically in, in, in this uh, industry. I see. I'm trying to ascertain as to how many of these communication major people wind, wind up in the same industry. And it sounds like you're fairly unique in your pursuit. And by luck, by chance, by fate, or by design, you, you get this job and it takes you on a journey and you're still in this, uh, this space. So it's, it's kind of cool to hear that. And, and the, the message I'm trying to send out to people here is uh, some, sometimes the things you do is just very through intentional action. And sometimes it's, it's luck and, and just to be able to recognize the opportunity when you see it and, and go on an adventure. And you might wind up being where you're at, Mika, which is director of creative strategy at a firm somewhere. That's so cool. Okay. I'd like to like shift gears here. And I want to talk to you a little bit about authenticity uh, you have a very strong perspective on this, and it is a term that's used a, a lot. And I remember a, a conversation with Debbie Millman, and she's like, you know, why, why are we talking about authenticity? Because it would infer that you're being inauthentic when you talk about authenticity. Like, who here is not being authentic at this moment in time? So why are we championing that as a term to be authentic? Are we saying that everyone is fake? What, what's going on? So I'd love to get your perspective on this. Yeah, so in, in my role, specifically building brand strategy and, and positioning, that word gets thrown out maybe more than any other word when a brand's trying to figure out who they are and what they stand for. And it sounds really nice. Who, who doesn't want to be authentic? And, you know, on the surface, that seems great. But it's, you know, the definition of it is, is of being authentic is being true to a, a character or a spirit. And a lot of times brands aren't really, they haven't figured out what that character or spirit is yet. Authentic is kind of a word that's used as a workaround um, when you're not quite sure. A lot of times you hear, you know, well, we know it in our gut or our brand is an attitude and we're, we're being authentic, but there's this extra layer of figuring out what that attitude is. What is that spirit that you're being true to? I think um, that the word authentic kind of is used in place of a lot of the times. How do you help a brand be true to a character or a spirit that they themselves have yet to be able to articulate to you? And you're an outsider here, presumably. Yeah, it's, it's workshops. It's a lot of interviews. It's writing down a lot of different ideas and seeing what feels right to them, what doesn't. Um, but yeah, that that's really the hard work. If you can crack that, then I think you have something a lot more ownable. Um, and I think something a lot more actionable. You know, the I think the best brand, brand strategies are any teams are able to use. If you're a designer, if you're a writer, there's this foundation that you can build from. But as a designer, if, you know, you're giving the word authentic, it's really hard to bring that to life if there's no other context around it. Are we, you know, being authentic to being youthful or rebellious or, or whatever, you know, the characteristics are, it's, you kind of need that foundation before you can say that you're being authentic to something. Oftentimes when we're trying to figure out the voice and the character of a brand, we trace it back to the founder's story. And it's easier for us because there are certain companies, there is a founder. It's not like a corporation imagining a new thing because the market requires it. Do you find parallels in what you what you do and trying to help them discover their true, their true voice, their character and their spirit? Yeah, a lot of times it comes from that. Um, it can also be a blend of, you know, where a brand has been and where they want to go. And sometimes that character or spirit doesn't exist yet or they're looking to reinvent it. So it can be a mix of the two. So in that case, they're designing the the brand. Their authenticity is is one that's intentional and designed, right? It's not coming from a place that has a natural origin. Yeah, exactly. And usually that comes through, you know, what we try to look at when building a brand strategy or um you know, what, what's true to the company. Um, we look at the competition. How are you differentiating from your competitors? What is your customer? You know, how are you going to resonate with your audience? 
and then what's happening in culture, you know, taking into account what's happening with the world around us. So if we are building something from scratch, that's kind of the different areas we try to hit to make sure that, sure, we're building this new spirit or character of a brand. We want to be authentic to that, but we have to make sure that that's going to resonate with who we're trying to communicate with. Mm. How do you resolve the conflict that inevitably comes up where we, we pick words and characteristics that feel right to us, but they don't truly reflect uh, the culture that's behind it, or that it winds up becoming a composite of many different positive attributes, but don't truly sound or act like anybody that we know? Yeah, I think that is a, a great point. I think you know, I'm, I'm kind of picking on the word authentic here, but I think there's a lot of words that are easy to use in a strategy. Like, I, I think we could probably build a strategy right now that would sound good to a whole bunch of brands if it was about being authentic and relatable and inclusive and bold. And who doesn't want to be those things, you know? But it's it's really hard to stand apart or to really create a brand that people love if if you're using these words that are maybe a little watered down or could mean a hundred different things to a hundred different people. So yeah, I always try to use words that are really um, actionable for people. So again, if you're a designer or a writer, you know what that means. Um, and I also like to, an exercise I do is I'm not sure if you do this, Chris, but a lot of times in a brand strategy document, you'll see we're blank, not blank, right? So we're authentic, not fake or something like that. I think the not words are almost just as important in, in defining what a brand is. Um, but what I try to do is for those not words, don't use something that no one would ever try to be, right? So we're authentic, not fake. Who, who would ever build a brand around being fake? So, you know, maybe it's we're, you know, rebellious, but not brash. You're kind of splitting hairs about what it is about this characteristic that we are and that we aren't without just going to the complete binary of what that word is, because oftentimes a brand would never want to stand for that anyways. Mm, I like that explanation. It, it is in alignment with the concept when we talk about focus and finding your market uh, Seth Godin, I was reading about this, he describes it as splitting the market. So you take a group of people and you keep splitting it until you are really clear about who it is that you stand for. And so it's easy to grab a word and that word can mean lots of things to lots of different people and then use the exclusion like we're rebellious, but we're not uh, brash. And that starts to find, oh, oh, okay, it's a certain kind of re rebellious spirit. I, I guess to the point of which you were saying, don't choose a word that nobody wants to be because everyone will claim the same thing. But also don't choose a word that also doesn't have any power because what's the point of that too? So it's finding that balance. And I guess that must be the role of the, the strategist, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a question for you. Just a real like two people talking about brand strategy here, which is when you encounter a client and typically when I say client, it's plural. There's more than one person in the room. And they're picking or making decisions that seem to water down the clarity of what it is that the brand stands for. How do you navigate that? Yeah, I think that is a great question. And I've definitely been uh, in those situations. Um, I think that's being completely transparent with, with the client and you know, clients typically don't hire an agency just to be a yes person. I think they value the opinion of a third party. And I think it's my job to give that opinion. If I do feel like we're going down a pathway, that's maybe not going to resonate with their target audience or not going to differentiate that, them in the landscape. As you said, that's usually when multiple people come together and there's maybe there's groupthink and they can't agree on a word or a phrase. So it kind of gets watered down and watered down into something that everyone can accept and doesn't really stand apart at all. But yeah, I've definitely been in those situations and I think it's, you know, on the agency, on the third party to kind of speak up when it feels like that's happening. How do you typically raise this? What's your style? Are you the uh, Don Draper where you're like, sign here, pick one word. I'll be ready to work when you start. Or are you more diplomatic or strategic? Like how do you handle these things where it feels like the 
it's dissipating and versus being concentrated in terms of the direction and the voice. How, how do you do that? I am so not cool like Don Draper. I could not do that. I, uh, <laughs> it's not my personality. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> in my personal life, I just hate conflict. And so I think that carries over into work too. So right. I, I try to go at it the most diplomatic way possible where I can completely empathize and understand with how we're getting to where we're getting to. But maybe we can take a couple step back, steps back, see maybe why this isn't going to be as powerful or as resonant an option that's going to move the needle as much as we like. Um, and just try to have an honest conversation. I certainly don't have all the answers, so I don't come in there saying that I do, but I can give my opinion on why I think we might need to course correct a bit and do it from a place of, you know, empathy, understanding, and, and yeah, being diplomatic about it. I, I should have known the answer was coming. This is the person whose most difficult thing in life to do is to quit. <laughs> so <laughs> getting clients to agree or choosing different words or something like that, you're going to be very diplomatic about it. Totally in keeping with your character. Um, I, I'm just sitting here thinking this, and I'm wondering, as a person who studied communications and now doing brand strategy, creative strategy, how did you learn how to do this? Was this on the job? Did you figure this out? Like somebody mentored you? How did you learn how to do this? Yeah, this was a lot of working uh, on the job. Um, I, I never encountered, you know, how to build a brand strategy, what those different you know, strategic pyramids are, those different levels, all, all those different models. I, I never encountered that in school. I think if anything, school helped me with public speaking and giving those presentations. There were a few of those classes that I had to take and there was some communication theory as well. But in terms of, you know, how to build the foundations of a brand voice guide, that was all on the job. And, um, Bo Bishop, who was the executive creative director at Loyal Casper, and he's actually now the executive creative director uh, or executive director of creative strategy, I should say, um, at Trollback now. So that's kind of how I came back to Trollback was I reunited with Bo Bishop. But he was uh, he was a great mentor for me when I first landed at Loyal Casper, kind of showing me the ropes, um, showing me how he did things, but still giving me the freedom to kind of build my own systems as I was learning along the way. So you, you learned on the job and you, you were able to put your writing skills to play. Here's something that a lot of people might feel in your situation where I didn't study this in school. So the imposter syndrome is going to be like yelling quite loudly. Right. And how did you, did you have issues with self-confidence? Like, Oh man, I didn't train in these, in this discipline. And so many people here did. And, I always feel like I'm an outsider looking in. Did you have those moments? And if you did, how did you resolve that? 100%. Um, I still have those moments sometimes. It's, you know, I'm, I'm much more confident now, but imposter syndrome is definitely a real thing, even especially when you're, you know, you don't have the, the skill set already built in. If you go to art school, you learn, you learn the tricks of the trade. You feel really confident coming out of school that you know how to do this. And then, you know, you get a job as a designer and, and off you go. Whereas you know, for me, yeah, I was, I was learning from scratch and I felt like, you know, the first present, the first times I was tasked to give a presentation or I remember the first pitch I had to lead, I was scared out of my mind because I had complete creative control, which was, which was awesome, but also terrifying to me. I definitely empathize with that. And like I said, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't ever truly go away for me, I don't think. Um, but with, with each project, with each presentation, um, you know, I get more and more confident and comfortable with the work I do. I want to ask you a little bit about a work experience, and then I want to come back maybe to some tips that you might have for people who are in a, in a position where they're working with clients and they want to help them with their creative strategy. I, I noticed that Trollback has an impressive list of clients, and you said before, sometimes uh, you can get anxious because these are massive multinational, uh, multi-billion dollar corporations and they're entrusting some initiative to you, either building a new brand or rebranding something that has a lot of equity in it. Can you share a story or two about, um, I don't know, one that you can share about a client interaction that 
you found like a breakthrough moment or something worth sharing? One moment where, where I had kind of a, a professional breakthrough, I'd say it was when I was, I was leading this pitch um, for the global brand positioning of Marvel. And this was where I, I kind of had the reins and, and I could do the pitch my way. And it, it's Marvel. It's the brand I love. I didn't want to mess it up. I went all, all in on this pitch. WonderCon was in Anaheim. So I went to WonderCon the weekend before the pitch. I just completely lived this lifestyle that these fans were living um, and put together the deck. Um, mostly after I went to that convention, because there were a few light bulb moments for me. And, you know, I'd say 40% of, of winning that pitch was probably the, the creative that was pitched, but 60% of it was showing that we got it and we get why you're doing this and we get the lifestyle that these people are living. Um, so, you know, that kind of helped where, yes, of course, the creative, the strategy matters a lot, but I think showing clients that you understand their challenges, you can help them through it. These are the solutions we got to because we understand all that was really important to me professionally. And it's kind of influenced a lot of how I approach giving presentations and, and presenting um, strategies to clients now. So you, you credit being immersed in the culture and experiencing it firsthand as helping to create those light bulb moments, these observations that you had? Yeah, I think, you know, for that specific one, there's no, there's not a wonder con for every project, but I think if anything, it, it helped me learn that in a presentation, especially a strategy, you know, the strategy itself might just be a couple pages, but it's taken the client on that journey leading up to how we got to where we got to, because I think that that story of why we believe this is the right solution for you is just as important as the solution itself. Can you expand on that? Because a lot of creatives don't think this way. They think this is the solution. This is what it looks like. And I'll reduce it down to its, its bare essence here, which is I make a logo. I'm, I'm going to present the logo absent any context. And you should pick this logo and sign the check and we should be done. Yeah, I would say I spend as much, if not more time, building brand strategy deck on the setup for what that brand strategy is, as I do on the positioning statement or the brand attributes or pillars or whatever goes into that. Because I do think it's really important if you just show up in a room and show a positioning statement to a client and they don't know why you got there, how you got there, it's really hard for them to buy in. But if you take them down this path and leave these breadcrumbs of, okay, we noticed this about your audience. We noticed this about what's happening in culture. We noticed this about your competition. And this is what you're really good at as a company. And together we created this statement and it might just be a sentence, but they understand, okay, this makes sense to me. This is accomplishing my goals for these reasons. So that's what I always try to do is, is tell the story behind how we got to a solution. So you take them through a some kind of narrative, I, t I take it, right? Some kind of narrative, some observations, some insights uh, based on, on on customer interviews or or social listening, as some people will call it, and, and building a composite and, and making connections where perhaps they knew instinctively, but they couldn't articulate and you kind of hold a mirror up to them. Does that sound about right? Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of what we do is you know, making the intangible tangible, I'd say when it comes to brand strategy or, or putting intuition onto paper. So yeah, it's, you know, a lot of times people might have a gut feeling about what they want their brand to stand for. And it's kind of codifying that, giving them some tools, but yeah, also giving them a, a reason to understand why that's correct or maybe and sometimes maybe why we don't feel that's correct but this other solution is correct um so yeah it's you know it's a lot of digging a lot of um a lot of these insights or the stories that we we tell before we get to a an actual positioning statement comes from stakeholder interviews too sometimes for a, a company it might be interviewing the core two or three people but i've been in rebrands where we've interviewed i think 47 people before we even put any sort of strategic document together. 
when people like you, strategists, say we do the research, this is what research sounds like, everybody. Research isn't getting on Pinterest or Behance and looking at things that you like and saying, I've researched. This is really kind of combing through the data and trying to look in spot patterns. And, and I love that expression, it's intuition on paper, which is like, that's a nice juxtaposition of two words there. Because you don't think intuition, isn't that something we feel and act upon? But you're saying it's on paper. So that's really cool. And if you if this idea intrigues you and you're, let's say, a logo designer, I'm going to just make a reference point here to Paul Rand's uh, beautifully written and, and illustrated process books where when he goes to present a logo to a, a large corporation, he takes them through the ideational phases and he writes about it. And it's a very logical process of how you start and where you end because his he's famous for I'm going to make you one logo. There are no revisions. You can use it. You can't. You don't have to use it, but either way, you have to pay me. And it's quite wonderful just to to look at that. And so it's a very logical narrative, and you can understand the decisions that are made and why he wound up where he wound up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And just last week, I, I gave a presentation, and 70% of it was what we decided not to do. It wasn't the actual solution. It was, these are all the paths we tried. These aren't working for whatever reason because of these insights we found. And now here's finally the solution we're arriving to. But, but again, it's, it's, yeah, taking, taking clients on a journey to, to the, eventually the final solution. Why is that valuable to a client to see all the things that you tried, but didn't work? I think so. They can feel, feel good about a final solution. I think a lot of times clients come to agencies because, you know, they, they have an idea, maybe they should do this, maybe they shouldn't. They need either validation somehow or someone to challenge those, that intuition. So I think part of servicing a client is, is showing the process of, of, how we get to where we get to. Um, I think they pay for our thinking just as much as the the solutions we arrive at and showing the thinking I think is, is really valuable. I think what a lot of smaller shops and generally speaking uh, freelance creatives don't realize is when they see the final execution, everyone starts to argue. Oh, that's so simple. You, you paid a hundred grand to do that. I could have done that. What they don't realize is the process you just just described, which is clients pay you a lot of money to do the due diligence, to explore, to try things, to test things, to prototype. What what the general public often never sees is that entire process. And so they've gone through a, a, a very uh, controlled process of eliminating things that don't work and exploring uh, what ultimately will be dead end so that they can arrive and reassure that this is the one correct solution. This is it. And so you'll see something set in Helvetica with a very simple modification or a very geometric icon that feels somewhat generic, but they've tried all the other things. And one thing that what design firms will do too, bigger design firms, is they'll take a more complicated logo that has more flourishes and personality, and they'll put it against a lot of different things like ads on a on a bus board or billboard in a, in a newsprint thing so you can see like ooh, this is competing with the central messaging it becomes more important and it doesn't allow the messaging or the tagline to work so again oftentimes we become very myopic as creative people we just focus in on the one component we don't realize it lives in a larger ecosystem and when you're a bigger firm you know that that's part of the process is that has it been your experience as well yeah, absolutely. Um, usually there's some sort of an intake process in whatever project I'm working on. And that might be a couple of weeks, that might be a couple of months. Sometimes we go really deep depending on how big the uh, the assignment is or you know how much change a client is looking for or, or how much research we need to do to to kind of turn over all the stones we need to turn over. And I should say, when I say research, it's not a capital R research. I'm I'm not doing segmentation studies and and focus groups. Um, If we do that, we we hire an outside firm because I'm by no means an expert um, in that, but it is stakeholder interviews. It's workshops with companies. It's 
desk research of kind of looking at at trends and trades and that sort of thing. Have you run into an experience where you go through that process of explaining, like, we tried this, that didn't work, and you go through it, and then you finish with the conclusion, like, this is why it looks like this today, only for the client to say, well, well, you know, exploration number three, where you say it didn't work, I don't know about that. Has that happened? For sure. And I'm trying to remember, <laughs> I'm trying to remember a specific example because I, I can picture that conversation happening. And, and I can't think of a specific example right now, but, but usually it happens when someone is seeing a presentation for the first time who hasn't been involved from the get go. So maybe they know the whole story. Maybe they don't, maybe they're seeing a condensed version of the overall presentation and it gets a lot more subjective. Cause I think what we try to do is, is make a solution as bulletproof as possible, prove out why this works from every angle we can imagine. And if my memory serves me correctly, when that's happened, it's usually been some consolidated or Frankenstein presentation that, that maybe doesn't have the full context. So it makes it a lot easier to, to kind of subjectively say, yeah, no, I, I don't really like that. That's not to say every every strategy I build is bulletproof and, and perfect, but it's a pretty collaborative process. So ideally, if we're working along the way, there aren't any surprises and we're kind of taking these baby steps to get to where we get to. So there, there usually isn't a surprise like that at the end. And if it happens, it's usually someone who's kind of coming in new to the process. I also wanted to highlight that uh, bigger firms that work with really big budget clients, high high profile clients with really big stakes that are involved, they don't go and disappear into their creative caves and reemerge and say, here it is. And ta-da, do you love it or what? Uh, that's usually the actions of a much smaller firm. And what you realize is the bigger the client, the more that's at stake, the more you have to kind of be one with the client that you're taking steps together. You're having a lot of meetings around milestones. And so that when you arrive at the end, everybody's on board. Cause that's probably one of the biggest challenges. It's not so much that designing the mark, the symbol, the system, the tagline is difficult. It is, but it's not as difficult as getting buy-in from everybody, making sure that all the key stakeholders involved see what you see and arrive at this very logical conclusion to say, instead of saying like, ta-da, or brilliant, they're saying, of course. You've been leading us down this path, and that seems to be the natural evolution. We're all still very excited about doing this together. Now, you mentioned something a couple of times, the word workshop. That might be a foreign concept to a lot of smaller design firms. And, and you talked about stakeholders and stakeholder workshops, potentially. Tell us what that looks like, if you can share some insight, uh, a framework, or a process that you found to be very helpful uh, so that everybody here can learn from you. Yeah. Yeah. I totally use brand speak there. So apologies, but yes, um, workshops can kind of come in two forms, either at the beginning of a process or at the end. So at the beginning of a process, usually that's getting people together, um, who work in different departments at a company and just hearing, say they're doing company X is doing a rebrand. We typically don't just talk to the marketing or the creative services department. We'll hear from, you know, we'll we'll hear from those departments. We'll hear from C-suite people. We'll hear from HR. We'll hear from coordinators. We'll hear from people at all levels across all departments, just so that we get a really kind of thorough understanding and, and wide base for for people's opinions about this brand and why it needs to change and what they'd like to see changed and and kind of get all the color we can get before we do any creative creative writing or or any strategic development so you know since since covid um that's typically been on zoom but before that it would be you know four or five hours sometimes where we'd get lunch brought in and throw up a bunch of whiteboards on a wall and you know, just say, okay, you know, what are some words that come to mind for your brand right now? Throw those up on a wall. Now, what words do you like? What words don't you like? Word, what words do you want to have associated with your brand? 
So it's, it's always very collaborative. Um, there's no right or wrong answers. It's usually pretty free flowing. We have a general agenda, you know, maybe we want to figure out the words that, that people want the brand to stand for, or think the brand should stand for, um, or words that they definitely don't want the brand to stand for. We might come in with those objectives, but it's usually pretty free flowing. I don't have like a set go to um, exercise. Um, it's usually just, just figuring out ways to get people comfortable and get people talking um, about their brand. Um, I will say sometimes we don't do workshops and instead we do one-on-one -on -one interviews. And that's typically if there is a really big group of people and maybe a coordinator would otherwise be in the room with the CEO. They might not feel comfortable just giving their complete honest opinion about the company or the brand. So we might do one-offs in that case. Um, but workshops are, are generally pretty good because one person tends to build off another person's idea and it's a, it's a very organic process that, um, that I think yields some results that maybe we wouldn't get from, from just doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. So it sounds to me like the workshop is really about involving one or more people in the creative process of talking through the idea so that you can help to generate new ideas or at least um, I get buy-in or just them familiar with the concepts and the direction in which this seems to be shaping or leaning towards, right? Yep, exactly. And, you know, usually these workshops are early on, so we want to at least get a gauge for what a client is thinking. There's usually a reason behind, say, a rebrand that they have a gut instinct that we should be doing this or, or we shouldn't be doing this. And that's a good starting point. And we, we like getting the, those insights on paper. There's still that whole process we talked about of looking at the competition and looking at the customers and making sure whatever we're talking about in this workshop aligns with, with what we're uncovering in the other research we're doing. But at least it gives us a foundation of this is the general direction. This is why they hired us and, and where they generally want to go. Wonderful. Um... I had a question about the practical, maybe a little more tactical question about you're, you're remote, you're based in Minneapolis. Do you fly to your, where your clients are? Do you meet them in person when you're doing these things? Like what's life like working remotely with your team, your internal team, but also with the clients? Like how are you conducting these workshops or these interim meetings where you're going through milestones? It is all completely remote now, which is very different from a couple of years ago. I, I, every single time I presented a, a strategy document or did a stakeholder interview, it was always in person. So um, it's, it's different now, but I, everything is completely remote. Um, presentations have all been remote. I uh, have not met anyone in person at Trollback, which is completely crazy to think of, you know, two years ago, I, I could not imagine that would be the case. Um, but yeah, everything has been remote. Uh, I think, you know, a silver lining to the world we're in now is there's opportunities to work with people who maybe you never would have been able to work for. I, I don't think I would have been able to, to work for Trollback, who's a, a New York based studio. Um, if it wasn't for where we find ourselves in right now. So it is what it is in terms of the world we're living in, but you know, at least we have this opportunity and I have this opportunity to reunite with Bo, who I loved working with in years past and, and work with this team um, at Trollback, who's, who's doing amazing work. And I love working with them, even though I technically haven't actually seen anyone face to face. Wow. That is a sign of the times. You you got a job where you're interviewed and you you meet the decision makers or whoever powers that be, and it's all done via remote teleconferencing. And now you work with your team and also with the client all remotely. And so in, in terms of, uh, this is just a very personal question for me here is that 
there is something to be said about like seeing someone, seeing how they react, their body language, the micro expressions. And sometimes on a Zoom call, they're the size of a postage stamp. And it's kind of hard to like feed on that energy to to notice resistance in the sub- most subtle ways or for them to be distracted. Like for all you know, it's a frozen picture and they're, they're somewhere else and you need their attention because at some point, they're going to say, well, well, who, who came up with this? Like, when did we sign on this? You know, when, when did we make this decision? And you're thinking, well, no, you've been at every single meeting, theoretically, but you actually weren't here. Uh, have you been able to navigate that pretty seamlessly or has it been a bit of a challenge for you? Pretty seamless. I will say the biggest challenge, I think, is the mute button on Zoom, which thankfully most people use on Zoom calls. So there, there's not a lot of... Uh, distractions in a big presentation. But the the flip side to that is you can't hear anything. You can't hear, you know, a chuckle if you're working on like a comedy brand. You just get crickets. You there's there's nothing you to your point that you can really feed off of or kind of get a gauge for for how a presentation might be going. Especially if you're full screen in presentation mode and then you can't see anyone's face either. So then you're really flying blind. Um, so that's definitely been a challenge. I think just, it, it is much tougher to kind of read, to read the room. Um, but there is this weird kind of humanizing effect that zoom tends to have where you see people in their home and you realize that everyone who's working on this is just a person. Everyone's, you know, moving to, for the same goal and it's humanizes people to, to maybe see them just at home and and listening to you while the kids are running around in the background or the dog is barking. There's something kind of calming to that as well. That's a nice way to look at it. I, I'm, I'm almost hundred percent sure no one from zoom is listening to this podcast, but I'd like to have a future request. Like zoom is good for broadcasting, but it's not good for dialogue and communication. I'd like to have one feature request, which is this is that, you as the host have the ability to move everyone's microphone input level down to a reasonable level so they can have a hot mic, but yet not be so loud and distracting. So if there's a dog barking, it's barking at a low level. So that way you can hear a little bit of the ebb and flow of the reaction of the room. So so if you're telling a joke or you're trying to be funny or sarcastic, you hear a slight chuckle. It's not at full val- volume, but something like that. Because at the very beginning, this is years ago because we've been using Zoom for a long time prior to the pandemic. And I would do a presentation full screen. I can't see anybody. I can't hear anybody. And it, it feels really dysregulating because now I just feel like I'm insane. I'm just talking to myself and no one cares and no one is paying attention. Right. And they could be laughing their heads off. I couldn't see them. I couldn't hear them. And that is a problem. So if we're going to continue on in this remote workplace, and, and Zoom is one of the leaders in, in video conferencing software, I'd love for them to solve this problem, please. That seem, seems like a, such a small technology tweak that you could do that would benefit greater dialogue. Forget about presentations. I'm just talking about dialogue. So I'm just going to put that onto the universe. Co-signed. I totally <laughs> agree. I'm I on board. I think I got an amen on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Mika, just to be respectful of your time, uh, we're a little bit past the hour mark here. I want to ask you one last question and then feel free to talk about anything. Uh, we've been hovering around this concept of authenticity and I think there's going to be air quotes around that word uh, because sometimes it can be hard to be authentic when you're inventing something and you're designing a brand. But what we're talking about is just being true to the spirit or the character as you've defined before. And true to your spirit as a non-con- non-confrontational person, I'm going to ask you a slightly confrontational question which is looking back on your career that spans you know, 14, 15 years, a little bit more. Is there any w- moment in that time when you zigged when you should have zagged? And, and looking back, you're like, you know what? I, uh, there's that one moment I should have done this. And that's the one little pebble in my shoe that I'm like walking around with. That is a great question. Hmm. Let me think about this. You know, I think there were, I think there were times when I, I was really hesitant and maybe didn't take on 
more creative type works that I now enjoy doing. So I, when I was first kind of moving into the creative strategy and writing side of things, I kind of just saw myself as a writer. And there were some opportunities to, I think, sit in edit bays and kind of help editors, um, you know, creative direct a bit, um, sit with designers, give my thoughts on maybe how that's working with a specific concept that we were building. And I didn't feel like maybe I belonged in those situations, even though I think I could have easily been in those situations. And I think, you know, helped the, the creative process along, but I, I just saw myself as a writer and I didn't, I guess I didn't have the confidence to, to maybe expand beyond that. Um, now, you know, I, I've directed a couple of shoots. I'm definitely wouldn't consider myself a director, but I've, I've at least like, you know, waded into those waters a bit, but, um, there were a few times where I just thought, you know, I, I'm really not comfortable doing this. I don't think that's my skill set. So I'm just going to stick to writing a positioning statement, writing some taglines and let the pros handle that. And I think I could have diversified my skill set a lot earlier if I put myself in, in some more of those uncomfortable situations. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I'm sorry to throw that question at you kind of out of left field, but oftentimes I think there's opportunities to learn when we reflect. I, I don't know where I heard this from, but wisdom is experience plus reflection. So you have obviously the experience and then I, I try and get my guests to reflect on their life to see like, huh, there's a little nugget for you. So what I'm hearing from you in that moment is uh, sometimes we're a little bit too uh, judgmental. We, we qualify ourselves too much, like, oh, who am I to say this? Or I haven't been trained or I haven't been doing this long enough to to then ultimately censor ourselves and not contribute to the greater creative good. It's like we're all putting our heads down to move the ball like a few inches or a few yards in one direction. And there could be something that you say that could be the worst idea ever, but then sparks someone else's thinking like, wait a minute, hold on a second here. That's a terrible idea, but if we made one tweak to it, it would be a wonderful idea, and that's how we brainstorm. And I can totally relate. I'm sure everybody who's listening to this can relate in one way or another, at least one point in their life, when we felt outmatched, outgunned, and underqualified, and so we started to sink into ourselves and feel really awkward and weird. And so to, to everyone who's ever felt that or is currently feeling that, just remember, you can throw out an idea, you can contribute to the creative process, with a healthy caveat that, hey, do with it as you wish, but I'm just trying my best to contribute to this conversation. It may or may not help you, but so that we don't have to shut ourselves down. And every once in a while, you're going to come up with a gem or you might come up with a bunch of duds, but either way, you need to exercise that muscle. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And, you know, being in the industry as long as I have been now, you know, I, I am very comfortable throwing out a million dud ideas because I've seen those duds get transformed by someone else into something great. So yeah, I do wish, you know, I was sitting in those edit bays earlier on because, you know, I might not have had a winning idea, but you know, maybe that could have sparked someone else to, to come up with a great idea. Mm. I, in, in this world, in, in these larger initiatives or when it comes to design or branding or, or writing uh, different campaigns it is truly a team effort and i say that with all the all earnestness and and respect because we all put our heads together and it's like the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and that's all we do or one part in the in the machine but we can contribute and we have value and with that i want to thank you Mika, for coming on the podcast for sharing your story is there anything that you wanted to talk about before we wrap up here no, I think uh, this has been a, a great conversation with you, Chris. Um, I've been listening to you and, and following you for a long time. So it was an honor to speak to you. And, and I think the information that, that you share with everyone is invaluable, especially for, for young people learning how to pursue their passions. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for, for all that you've done over the years. Thank you so much for saying that. It, it warms my heart to hear someone who's still in the industry, who's doing work that's relevant, that we're going to see on air, or on print, or on the side of a building somewhere to say that, because it's been a very long journey for you, Mika. 
from being a person who's like you said on the box and kind of just quietly working or toiling away in very small circles but then to be able to leave that behind and to have this conversation it's it's a real treasure for me so i i do appreciate you saying that and uh, on behalf of everyone who's listening to this you provide yet another um shade of paint to this really rich tapestry that we're all trying to build and so i do appreciate you thanks chris Mm -hmm. and if people want to find out more about you where where might they go yeah, I've been weaning myself off social media for the sake of getting to bed at a decent hour. So I think the best way would probably just to connect with me on LinkedIn. There's not a lot of Nika Salidas in the world, so I'm pretty easy to find there. That's a very unique name. Is it is it Greek? It sounds Greek, but it's it's Latvian. My dad's side of the family is from Latvia. His name is Mika Salidas. You can find him on LinkedIn. He's he's off social media, so just connect with him there and continue the dialogue. Okay. That's it for us. Thank you so much. 